us. Join us and we'll show you the greatness of SSU. Summer State University, soaring high with excellence. Seed of innovation, we'll build a super nation. Summer State University, it's the best for you and me. Your future and dreams come alive. So come on to Summer State University. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for finding time to join today's webinar on writing and packaging research articles for journal publication. Today is our fourth day of this webinar series. My name is Hannah Makawili and I will be your moderator. Before we officially start, I would need you to participate in our sound and visual check. If you can hear and see me well, kindly type yes and send it here in our Zoom chat box. All right, I think we are all set. I can see your responses in the chat box. I think everything is working well. So just a few reminders before we start. Today's webinar is live at Summer State University's official YouTube channel. We are encouraging everyone to share the YouTube link with your social networks. And if you have any questions during the presentation, please send them to the Zoom chat box located at the bottom part of your screen. I will bring them up later at the question and answer portion. Lastly, the links of the Google Forms for attendance, session evaluation, quiz, and the activities that will be given by our speakers and facilitators will be uploaded and sent to you later via here at the Zoom chat box and email. All right, so I believe all our participants are here for one reason, that is to engage in journal publication. Of course, your attendance here will be credited to you because we will be giving certificates by the end of all sessions. So this is a gentle reminder to not miss out any session of this webinar series. Now let's begin. In this session, we will be exploring the subject of writing a research methodology. To give the recap and the evaluation results of the previous sessions, let us welcome Ms. Maria Jessa Pachoma from the University Publications. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, could you hear me well? So last Monday's topic, writing the research introduction and objectives, was a cup of tea of our speaker, Dr. Ray and Jane Rosales, who gave our fresh air on the topic. Noob and the experts alike were able to completely comprehend the talk because of Dr. Rosales' approach. She first gave the importance of drafting a good written introduction. It must stimulate the reader's interest, provide sufficient or information given overview of what to expect in the paper. According to the speaker, the research introduction is not meant to be comprehensive. Um, excuse me, Ms. Pakama, um, we request that you uh, fix your microphone or your connection because we can't hear you very well. Thank you.
All right, while we are waiting for Ms. Pakoma, we have here participants from DepEd, Kalbayog, Sir Antolen. Um, we have from Summer State University, Arian Salsado. We have participants who are Ariel Domingo, Edison Uy. From EVSO, Mam Theodora Pixon, Herbert Fabillar, Jihan Adil, Leodoro Labrage. As of now, we have over 30 participants. Hello, good afternoon. All right, so last Monday's topic, the writing research introduction and objectives was the cup of tea of our speaker, Dr. Rhea Jane Rosales, who gave our participants a breath of fresh air on the topic. Noob and the experts alike were able to completely comprehend the talk because of Dr. Rosales' approach. She first gave the importance of drafting a good written introduction. It must stimulate the reader's interest provide sufficient context or background information, give an overview of what to expect in the paper. Writing a good introduction means leaving a first impression to the readers that will last. She then enumerated the steps and how to write it. Comprehensively, Dr. Rosales expounded each step. According to the speaker, the research introduction is not meant to be a comprehensive literature review, so the researchers must not overwhelm the readers with a sea of citations. Afterwards, Dr. Rosales tackled the qualitative and quantitative purpose statements. She emphasized that the editors and readers alike will not be interested in the reading of the study if it is merely a repetition of what has already been done by the others. There are questions that should be answered in the introduction, and Dr. Rosales presented at least in tabular form. Then Dr. Rosales gave some helpful tips to guide the participants in writing, such as using the active voice in sentences, being concise, and avoiding no nominalization. After that, Dr. Rosales differentiated the meaning of aim and objective. The objectives are basically the specific steps and one needs to take to achieve the aim. Dr. Rosales enumerated the important guidelines that should be observed when developing research objectives. Afterwards, Dr. Rosales gave an exercise to the participants and the winners of the game received the special prizes. At the end of the talk, she asked the participants, are you ready to write? With her talk, I believe her listeners were enabled to write. That's it for the recap and enjoy the rest of the session. Thank you so much, Ms. Pakoma. So we acknowledge the presence of Dr. Leodoro Labrage, the Countryside Development Research Journal Editor-in-Chief, and Dr. Mark Abd Abadiano, the ex External Associate Editor of CDRJ and JAR. All right, now to introduce our speaker for this session is the Director of Summer State University's Guidance Services, Dr. May Kanyal. Hello, good afternoon. Our resource speaker is an Assistant Professor in Summer State University who teaches social sciences and psychology. She is currently the Director of Alumni Services Director of Institutional Student Programs and Services, and the Research Coordinator of the College of Arts and Sciences. She has published five research papers in reputable journals, such as International Journal of Multidisciplinary Approach and Studies, International Review of Social Sciences, and International Journal of Social Science Studies. She also has served as resource speaker in different institutions in part imparting her expertise in research. She is known as an expert on qualitative research method. That is why she is one of the professors teaching in the SSU graduate school. Despite the heights of her achievements, she is still unstoppable in the pursuit of, advan of advancing the body of knowledge. Her platforms become wider and influence gets bigger, as he also won during the recent Elinius Dio Award as the model student of the graduate school. Ladies and gentlemen, our speaker for this afternoon, Dr. Abigail 
makas pagkabagay niya. can hear me now okay so methodology is one of uh, the most important chapters in your entire work because what it's gonna tell the reader essentially is the step by step um, you went through to collect the data necessary in order to address your research aim so this is the chapter that has to be very well written because if you made wrong decisions in your methodology, um, that's going to compromise the rest of your work. Say, if you collect the wrong data or the data which is, uh, or you collected the, the data which is not valid, you are, you are not address, addressing your research aim. So all the results, all the conclusions you have is weak or even not valid. So this is the most important and the most critical chapter. Um, you have to make sure that you, uh, you get most decisions correctly. Oh. Wait, something's wrong with my screen. Don't look it up on screen. I can't screen. All right, while we are fixing uh, technical errors, again, we are reminding everyone that if you have any questions while the lecture is ongoing, you may send those questions to the Zoom chat box located at the bottom part of your screen. We are gathering your questions to be brought up later at the open forum. Thank you. Okay, so let me continue. Um, why is this section so important? As what I've mentioned earlier, your research methods affect the findings and how you interpret or you analyze them. It is also the credibility of your findings and discussion um, depends on the reliability of your research methods. This was already mentioned earlier, and it also helps other researchers conduct better research. This is the section of uh, the paper that is being looked into if we are going to replicate the study. So if we have a good, a good method, then the, the other researchers will be able to also come up with a better research or will be able to yield a better research. So we have to make sure with our methods. Okay, so before I proceed to the different sections in the methodology, let me first clarify to you the difference between method and methodology because most of the time, we use these words interchangeably. Okay, when we say research methods, uh, research methods are the processes through which you conduct research into a given subject or topic. Um, it includes the processes, meaning it focuses on the, the data analysis. While the research methodology explains the methods by which you may proceed with your research. So the methodology explains the reason behind you or the rationale behind your research. 
research methods also involves the different the, the conduct of experiments, surveys, interviews. Well, research methodology involves the analysis and learning of the various techniques that can be used in the conduct of experiments, surveys, and interviews. The research methods also aim at finding answers to research questions. On the other hand, the research methodology aims at understanding and employment of the correct procedures to find credible answers to research questions. So what I'm saying here is that research methods are the approaches that are used in the conduct of your research. So it has something to do with the techniques, which has uh, uh, which is concerned on the collection of the data. It has something to do with the processes, which is focused on the data analysis. And it also has something to do with the instruments, um, the one that you use to carry out your research tools. And methodology is uh, the rationale behind your research. And this is the lens through which you will be able to analyze your results. So therefore, um, what's the relationship between methods and methodology? So we say that method or the methods are the tools used to carry out the research. While the methodology is the overall framework that we use to understand the factors affecting the effectiveness of our methods. So in a nutshell, we can say that methodology is how you will answer your research question and the method is what you do to collect your data okay so let me proceed to the methodology section um, in order to make the methodology clear i have divided it into different sections but in uh, this is relative to the format of the different institutions or in different publishing company. Okay. So the methodology will answer how you did, what you did, and why you did it. So in this section, you are going to explain what step you took to carry out the research. And then you are also going to explain how you carried out that uh, research. And uh, also, you need to justify any decision you made in order to carry out your research. So again, you need to know, explain what step you took, uh, how did you do it, and also you need some justifications. Okay, for the, methodol uh, for the methodology sections, we have, this is uh, the generalized, um, generally this is the sections found in the publications and even in uh, thesis and dissertations. This is the research, uh, we have the research design, we have research local, the participants of the study, data collection, data analysis, and ethical consideration. So Ethical con consideration, this is just new. Um, some uh, previously in other journals, they did not ask for a paragraph of uh, the ethical consideration, but right now I think almost all journal journals are already um, having this ethical consideration as part of the methodology section. Okay, so research design. The research design, this is uh, the choice of your research um, design. How you are going to carry out your research and the reasons for that choice. Okay, let's start with your research question. Now, you think about your research questions and what information you need to address it. I know you, I suppose you already, you have your papers there and uh, try to look at the research, your research aim. And uh, I guess you, you were already, you already have uh, made your introduction. Okay. So now ask yourself, what kind of data would you help you answer this question? 
how would you want to present your result? Okay. Okay. If you want to understand a phenomenon or the behaviors and experiences of a group of people, then you, you are using more of an exploratory approach in which a, quali a qualitative paradigm might give you the best result. On the other hand, if you want to look for correlations, comparisons, relationships, or trends, then a quantitative paradigm might work better. So the nature of the study will indicate the research design that you should use. Okay? So I'll give you a brief discussion on qualitative and quantitative, and then and the designs later on. So according to Creswell, there are two major research paradigms. We have qualitative and quantitative paradigms. Qualitative research questions usually aim to explore a question with no set hypothesis beforehand. So a qualitative approach is more about gaining in-depth insight than it is about empirical generalization that can be applied to a population. So when you do qualitative research, your aim is really to explore and to go um, to have an in-depth insight of a particular phenomenon. Now, the design of qualitative studies is naturalistic and emergent. One of the characteristics of a qualitative research is that it should be naturalistic. It, uh, it looks at a real world situation as they unfold naturally and there is a lot of preset limitations on findings. So meaning um, phenomenon happen or experiences happen in, an, in a very natural way or it just unfold naturally. Um, in a naturalistic setting, we look at situation in multiple realities. Considering that a qualitative research look at realities, um, we have multiple realities in qualitative research. Unlike in quantitative, we only have a single reality. Okay, um, we have multiple realities because uh, this approach is subject subjective in nature. And another characteristic of a qualitative design is qualitative is emergent and it is also flexible. So the researcher is open to adjusting her research questions and methods to pursue new lines of inquiry as they, may, as they emerge. So since we need to explore, we don't know exactly uh, what will emerge in the data collection. So if we don't know what will uh, come through or what will emerge, then we can adjust our research questions. Kahit an, um, depende kung ano yung lumabas. And um, yes, in qualitative research, we can adjust our research questions. And even we can also adjust our methods depending on the data that uh, we derived or we collected. Okay, on the other hand, uh, in quantitative research questions uh, usually contain a hypothesis and uh, it, it try to predict something. Approaches like you might ask how much, how often, this, then that can be a descriptive type of quantitative research. Then you can also ask questions like what is the difference between? It can be a comparative quantitative research or you want them to know the relationship or if uh, there is a relationship between or difference between um, relationship-based quantitative. Quantitative studies are characterized by tools that are carefully designed before data is collected. So it has larger sample sizes compared to qualitative research and the ability to be replicated. Now, your next question is, which approach is right for me, for your research? So before you decide which paradigm will best fit 
for your research questions, you think about what you want to know and the nature of your research questions, how you want to collect your data and who you are as a researcher. Who you are means how you are going to approach the materials in your study. Okay, so let's look at the, the positivist paradigm. The positivist paradigm is quantitative in nature. So basically, it focuses on facts, look for causality and fundamental laws. It reduces phenomena to simplest elements. Um, it also formulates hypotheses and tests them. It operationalizes concepts so they can be measured. And it takes large samples. On the other hand, qualitative is uh, interpretivist uh, is following the interpretivist paradigm which is focused on meanings and they try to understand what is happening they look at the totality of each situation and they develop ideas through induction from the data so the quantitative is using the deductive method while the quantitative is using the inductive method. And also it uses multiple methods to establish different views of the phenomena. And unlike one quantitative, which take large samples in qualitative research, small samples investigated in depth over time. Okay, I'll present to you a very simple comparison of qualitative and quantitative research. So the, in terms of purpose, the qualitative research um, is focused on discovering ideas, discovering ideas with general research objectives. On the other hand, quantitative research will try to test the hypothesis or the research questions are more specific. In terms of approach, uh, qualitative research uh, makes use of observation and interpretation and in quantitative research, uh, we do measurement and testing. And also in the data collection approach, um, in qualitative research, uh, the data is um, in free form. Um, the questionnaire is, in, um, there are semi-structured, they're unstructured. Uh, in quantitative, the data collection approach is structured. Uh, it uses a structured response and there are categories provided. Okay, so in terms of researcher independence, research in qualitative research, the researcher in qualitative research is intimately involved. And then the results are very subjective. Now, in quantitative research, researcher can be uninvolved, which um, also, the results are very objective because in quantitative research, you can just conduct survey and then in qualitative, you really have to penetrate the person. You have to conduct an in-depth interview with your participant. And then in qualitative research, as what I've mentioned earlier, it happens in a natural setting. Uh, well, in quantitative research, uh, um, large samples to produce generali uh, generalizable results. So, okay, so before I proceed to the different research designs, let's ha have first an activity. This is just a very simple activity. Um, this activity, you are just going to identify if the data that I'm giving you is qualitative data, quantitative data, or can be both. So this is just a five item quiz. Okay, so let's start. Observing the, the social interactions of preschool children in a playground using predetermined items on an observation checklist. So is this a qualitative data, quantitative data, or both? Yes, you can write your answer in the chat box. Okay, is this data qualitative or? Uh, you, they can just answer. Uh, one minute will do. I cannot. 
Ah. Okay, Dr. Fen, I think the response is clear. Okay. What are their answers? Uh, one, two, three, one, two, three. I can't hear you. Doctor Tabari. Okay, okay, no. Okay. Okay. So, what are their answers, Ma'am Hani? I cannot see. First answer is quantitative, but we have answers as qualitative. So, Dr. Kabaging. Okay. So, some of them, how many answered quali and how many answered quanti? I have two quantitative answers and four qualitative answers. Sorry. Okay, so observing the social interactions of preschool children in a playground using a predetermined items and an observation checklist is the qualitative data. Yes, tama po si Sir uh, si Ma'am Shudara from EVSU, si Sir Ariel. Yes, it is qualitative. Why? Because you observe the social interactions. So there is an observation. Okay, next. Conducting an experiment to investigate whether having regular rest breaks during a prolonged study session improves performance on a test. So is this qualitative data or quantitative data? Okay, you conduct an experiment. Okay. You are okay. Quanti, quanti, okay. Majority of the answers say quantitative. Yes. Topic. It is quantitative because they conduct an experiment. Okay, next. Observing whether drivers conform to ro uh, road rules by counting the number of drivers who disobey a stop sign at an intersection. So is this a qualitative data or a quantitative data or both? Observing whether drivers conform to road rules by counting the number of drivers who disobey a stop sign at intersection. Okay. Majority of the answers say both, ma'am. Other are qualitative responses, quantitative. Okay. Both. So the answer here is quantitative data because your aim is to count the number of drivers who disobey. So there is counting. Okay, next. Investigating the effects of observing violence by analyzing and interpreting children's drawings after they have watched violent cartoons on television. So is this quality, quantity, or candid point? Yes, Sir Ariel, quality. All right, okay. so far, qualitative answers. Okay, so you are correct. This is um, a qualitative research data. Okay, last one. Studying the behavior of newborn infants by observing and recording their second-by-second -second movements during their first 72 hours of life following birth. So what is this? Is this qualitative data, quantitative data, or both? Okay, both, both, both. Yes. So everyone, okay, most of the answers. Most of the responses are both. Okay, so yes, you are correct. This can be qualitative or quantitative data because the aim is to observe, which is very qualitative, and the record, which is quantitative, okay? Now, let me proceed to the research design. I'll just 
give you an overview of the different designs commonly used. So we have quantitative research designs, we have qualitative research designs, and I also try to look into the mixed method research designs. Okay. So quantitative research design, this is a systematic investigation of phenomena by gathering quanti quantifiable data and performing computational um, techniques. So I have here uh, a decision tree model for quantitative researches. You're, um, you might, okay, you can ask yourself, is there a cause and effect relationship in your study? You want to know if there is a cause and effect relationship? So if there is no cause and effect relationship, then again, you will ask, is there a relationship or prediction being made? Then if there is a relationship or prediction, then you can make use of correlational quantitative design, correlational data approach. Okay. If there is no relationship or prediction being made, then your quantitative research design can be descriptive. Okay. Now you may ask, uh, if there is a relationship, uh, given that if there is a relationship, a cause and effect relationship, is the independent variable manipulated? If there is manipulation of variables, then you use experimental method. If there is no uh, manipulation of variables, then you can make use of the causal comparative method. Okay, this is just an overview for a quantitative research design which are commonly used. Okay, in qualitative research designs also. Um, qualitative research designs are characterized by the combination of, uh, is characterized by um, establishing answers to the how and to the why of the phenomena. Okay, I have a here, uh, a guide in choosing an appropriate qualitative approach for your study. This was adopted from Chris Will, and uh, this will help us identify what qualitative approach are we going to use. Okay, is your purpose to collect participant stories or to capture a group of participant stories and retell their stories? then if yes you can make um, you can make use of narrative inquiry approach but uh, if you do not have uh, or if you uh, your purpose is not uh, to capture the story of a participant however you want to know or you want to examine their experiences do you want to capture participants experiences and examine how they make sense of their experiences then you can make use of phenomenological approach. Now, if you do, um, if you do not just want to examine the, their experiences and you want to develop an explanation or if you want to develop a model or a theory that helps in understanding a phenomena or a situation or process, then you are going to use grounded theory approach. Now, if you also want, uh, so grounded approach na siya. However, if you don't want to proceed to come developing a, a theory and you just want an in-depth study of a well-defined case or phenomenon using multiple data sources, then the case study approach is applicable. However, if you want to explore a phenomenon by studying a group of people or individual in their natural environment, then an ethnographic, ethnographic approach will do. Okay, so for the mixed methods design, um, mixed method design is characterized by a combination 
of at least one um, one quality and one quantity. Okay. So interesting and appropriate mixed method design, which are, this is also designed by Cresswell. Okay, if you start with um, one method, if your study starts with one method and ends with another method, then you are using sequential mixed method design. Okay, sequential um, from quality to quantity or from quantity to quality. If uh, you start with a quantitative phase and ends with a qualitative phase, then that is what we call sequential explanatory mixed method design. Quantity to quality, sequential explanat explanatory. On the other hand, if you start with a qualitative phase and ends with a quantitative phase, then it is, uh, the design is sequential exploratory mixed method design. From quality to quantity is exploratory um, mixed method design. If the sequential mixed method design, you, uh, if you have an advocacy role, say if, for example, you want um, the output of your research is to come up with a program, then you can make use of sequential transformative mixed method design. Okay, so the sequential designs, uh, it starts from one method and end in another method. How about if it's not the case? How about if you are going to use both methods at the same time? Okay. So did you know? You start with both qualitative and the quantitative methods, then you are going to use concurrent mixed methods design. So sabay mo silang gagamitin. Sabay yung um, pag, uh, sabay yung qualitative data and quantitative data. Mm -hmm. So if you have an uh, an advocacy role also in uh, in your research output, then you can make use of concurrent transformative mixed method designs, okay? So you carry out both qualitative and quantitative phases as the same, um, at the same time to address a, phenom a phenomenon. So if it is the case, then you use concurrent triangulation mixed methods design. So if not, and you carry out both qualitative and quantitative phases at the same time with the one dominant approach, then you can make use of concurrent nested mixed methods. Okay, now let me ask our participants, uh, uh, ano ang research design na ginagamit niyo sa study niyo um, with the paper you have right now? Are you more, I want to know if ilan yung nagkakwanti, ilan yung nagkakwali, ilan yung nagmi-mixed method. I suppose you have your paper with you. Okay. We have here, ma'am, a resp response from Sir Emerson Gilbar. Gilbar. Uh, he makes use now of sequential exploratory, sequential okay. exploratory, exploratory. Method. Yes, from qualitative and then the result of your um, qualitative phase is used in, is that developmental, sir? Developmental of something? Is it okay? Right. Okay. okay. Any more answer? How about the others, Bo? So we have sequential exploratory mixed methods design. How about the others? You have quantitative? You have qualitative or nalito na din kayo <laughs> kung anong design? <laughs> okay, is it? Uh, yes, you can share your the title of your study and then you share if uh, you can share your aim, your objective, and then you can also share your design. Yes, very okay, quality ma From jo from Mom Joy Belen, uh, she uses the descriptive phenomenology. Phenomenology. Okay, see. And then we also have 
last. We also have measurement Sir Amazon. Yes, booster. You develop a standard tool to measure. Yes, booster. Same po tayo. I also use exploratory sequential design because I also develop the occupational stress test. Okay. Okay, thank you for your responses. I hope you already um, uh, that it, just, it was just an overview of the different designs. For the research design content, you need to explain the research methods used, as, as mentioned, if it is qualitative, quantitative, or mixed. And please, um, you have to really specify what specific method. You just don't say, um, I'm using a qualitative study, I'm using a quantitative um, approach, I mean, or I mean, this is very common, which I usually observe. This, uh, say for example, I was uh, able to read a thesis or a dissertation stating that mixed method research design was used. So you have to specify what specific mixed method design are you using. So hindi pwedeng sasabihin lang na qualitative design to. Ano yung, anong approach ang ginamit sa qualitative? Anong approach ang ginamit sa quantitative? And the research design um, you should present the method and not just present, you also need to define the method used. And in, the, in defining the methods that you're going to use, of course, to observe proper citation. And then there is a need to really justify why the method is appropriate for your study. I'll give you an example. So I'll be, um, for a quantitative study, I asked permission from Mom Guerra if I can use her study. Uh, this is already published in the CDRJ. The title of her study is Mediating Role of Coping and Stress Responses in Relation to Corporal Punishment and Peer Aggression. So if you can notice um, her research design, so completo siya. Um, uh, she, pres uh, she presented that this is a correlational predictive design and then she was also able to um, justify why there is a correlational predictive design between, okay, this study used the correlational predictive designs and since it aimed to identify predictive relationship between corporal punishment and peer aggressions and identify related variables such as, okay. That is for the quantitative part. For the qualitative part, okay, I'm using my my paper entitled Motherhood and Studenthood, the uh, lived experiences of a college student mother. This was also published in International Review of Social Sciences. So if you can notice, I also put it here. Uh, I, yes, I included the, the method, which is a qualitative study and using phenomenological approach. And then I was also able to define the methods used, what is qualitative and then why, what is phenomenology. I also have here uh, citations. And then I justify why the method is appropriate for, you, for the study. The researcher found this method most applicable to the inquiry in order to provide a comprehensive analysis on the lived experiences of student mothers. Okay, so in the research design, do not forget the, um, the content should be, you should present the method, you need to define the method, and you need to justify the method that is appropriate for your study. Okay. For the research local, of course, um, this is common. This is the place or setting of the study. It describes in brief the place where the study is conducted and um, only important features which have the bearing of the present study are included. Participants of the study, you need to describe the populations, the sample size, the sampling methods or techniques used. In um, some papers, uh, in dissertations and in thesis, research locale is separated from the participants of the study. However, there are journals na nilalamp na lang yung 
research local at yung participants of the study. So I have here an example. I'll be using uh, the same paper uh, of Mom Guerra. So in the respondent section, she mentioned snowballing sampling. She also, she also mentioned the range of uh, the age of uh, the participants. Um, and then, then the total number of uh, participants. How is it in quality? So in quality, uh, in quality method, uh, in um, identifying your participants, uh, most of the time it uses purposive sampling. So, and the researcher can choose uh, the participants. The, in qualitative research, you need to come up with a selection criteria as to who your participants are. And um, in this study, in my study, I was able to um, present the selection criteria of who my participants are. So these are um, student mothers who, let's see. Okay, so um, my uh, selection criteria in includes student mothers participated in the study. Um, uh, bona it should, uh, the, the student should be a bona fide student of Summer State University, a biological mother, single parent or married, and uh, had the custody of the child or living with her child, and of course, willing to participate in this study. Okay, now. In the data collection method, so data collection is a process of gathering and analyzing specific information to proffer solutions to relevant questions and evaluate the results. The data is collected to be further subjected to hypothesis testing, which seeks to explain a phenomenon. So we have two types of data collection. We have a primary data collection and secondary data collection. Primary data collection, we gather raw data. And uh, we also collect original data. And then this can, we can have a primary data collection for both quantitative and qualitative data. In the secondary data collection, we gather secondhand data. And um, so, uh, this is uh, commonly used in data mining. And we collect data that is already existing. And uh, let's say, for example, in published books, journals, or online portals. In quantitative data collection, we make use of these tools. So pwede siyang face-to-face, pwede siyang online, um, mail, or phone. So you can, we can have... Uh, um, we can gather data through survey, an online survey, or we can have it face-to-face. -face. And then in the data collection for qualitative, we can have, of course, in-depth interview is very common. We can also have groups, uh, in, uh, group interview, FGD, focus group discussion. We can also do interview online, online forums. And then we can have web survey, chat, and online community. Okay. So instrumentation is, uh, um, in some journals, instrumentation is part of the data collection. However, there is, uh, in a thesis or dissertation, this is separated. Instrumentation refers to the tools or means by which investigators attempt to measure variables or items of interest in data collection methods. So, okay, what instrument did you use in gathering your data? So, for example, in this, in the study of Mam Guerra, she makes use of the corporal punishment scale, the uh, stre um, stress questionnaire scale. You need to mention the different instruments that were used. In the, in the gathering of your data. And um, say for example, you adopted, or you make use of the standardized test. Um, you will not just mention 
what standardized test did you use? But you also need to mention the validity and reliability of that standardized test. Yes, kailangan po siyang i-include, which is sometimes hindi sinasali ng mga, hindi include ng mga researchers. Okay, how about if it is a self-made test? If it is a self-made test, kailangan din siyang i-discuss sa instrumentation how the instrument was validated. And uh, the processes that you went through for the data um, validation. Okay? In qualitative, in terms of data collection, um, of course, uh, we make use of interviews uh, in collecting data. Commonly, we make use of interviews. And this, uh, the researcher for this uh, um, study make use of a semi-structured interview to collect the data. And then you also need to uh, place in your data collection how the interview guide was validated. There is a need to validate also the interview guide. Okay. So if you can notice here in the data collection, um, the researcher also provided an agreement included. So um, informed consent, confidentiality. Uh, previously, the, the journal, uh, I don't have the ethical consideration here. But uh, that's the reason why I included it in the, the ethical consideration was included in the data collection. Okay, now let's proceed to the data analysis. So, um, in the data analysis, you have to discuss how you are going to analyze your data. So in, quantitative, in qualitative data analysis, um, most of the time, we identify common patterns within the response and critically analyze them in order to achieve the aims and objectives. On the other hand, in quantitative data, uh, it involves critical analysis and interpretation of figures and numbers. And this is the part where you can use the statistical tools and st statistical treatment of your data. Okay, say for example, this one. Um, in the quantitative analysis of Mamgera, she made use of the mediation. Okay. The mediation process. And she also include the use of the software in the, um, in the analysis, which is the SPSS. On the other hand, in qualitative research in the data analysis, I mentioned here the the framework of uh, the data analysis of uh, the data analysis I use, which is phenomenological in nature, and uh, the process, the Heisner process, where I adapted the data analysis, and uh, I have read the several uh, papers uh, stating, especially in qualitative research in the data analysis, most of them are stating that. Qualitative, uh, data, uh, qualitative data analysis, they just make use of thematic analysis. And commonly, I think almost all of the of qualitative uh, data analysis are using thematic analysis. However, it is not enough to just say, I'm just using thematic analysis. You need to identify and you need to write down uh, the framework of the analysis. Can, can I, uh, kaninong siya in-adopt, kaninong data analysis. Say, for example, in phenomenology, we have Colizy, we have uh, Mostakas. In case studies, we have Yen. So we really need to um, write down the, the processes and the, the framework where we are getting, or we, where, uh, what framework we are following in conducting the data analysis. Okay, now, um, another uh, addition 
additional section in the methodology portion is the ethical consideration. So as what I've mentioned earlier that um, there are studies that they don't have the ethical consideration part. However, they just place it in data collection or the data gathering procedure. But most, in most journals now, we, we already have the ethical consideration. And we need to consider this one. We need to write it in, in a paragraph, the things we need to consider. Say, for example, voluntary participation of the respondents. And then another thing in terms of ethical consideration, informed consent. Response, the respondents should participate on the basis of informed consent. So it, it should be noted there. And then the use of offensive, discriminatory, or other unacceptable language needs to be avoided in the formulation of questionnaire, interview, or focus group discussion. Opo, kay, uh, kahit, sa, kahit yung instrument nyo, yung uh, tinitingnan po in, in doing the review or in reviewing the, your ethics. Privacy and the anonymity or respond of respondents is of paramount importance. And then you also need to maintain the highest level of objectivity in the discussion and the analysis throughout the research, especially in qualitative research that it is very subjective. And sometimes you really cannot um, help but to inject your idea. But it depends. If you make use of transcendental phenomenology, uh, then uh, you must have, you must practice reflexivity or you must practice bracketing. But if you make use of hermeneutic phenomenology, then you can be part of the research. So, so you are not just the co, you are not just the researcher, but also you are the co-participant in the study. Okay, so most universities have their own code of ethical practice. Uh, it is critically important for you to thoroughly adhere to this code in every aspect of your research and declare your adherence in ethical considerations part of your paper. So luckily in Summer State University, we have the Institutional Research Ethics Review. So before the data, the actual data gathering, we make sure that all the papers are already reviewed and went through the um, ethics committee. Okay. Okay. I'm done with my discussion. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Kabagin, for that jam-packed lecture. I'm sure our viewers listened well and have prepared questions to be answered by our lecture. Just a heads up, we will only accommodate five questions from the audience all right since we are still waiting for your questions we acknowledge our viewers from all over the region we have viewers from eastern summer state university nwssu absu albayo katbalogan deped palumpon institute of technology and silanga national high school to our viewers you may want to raise questions Please share them here at our chat box. Also, in a few minutes, we'll be uploading the Google form for attendance here at our Zoom chat box. Again, the session evaluation, quiz, and the activities that will be given by our speaker and facilitators will be uploaded sent and sent to you later via here at the Zoom chat box and email. Again, please raise your questions and share them here at our Zoom chat box. We are waiting and we have already uploaded the Google form for attendance. It is here in the chat box. You may want to access that later.
Okay. Uh, we acknowledge the participation of the editor in chief of CDRJ, uh, Dr. Leodoro Labrake. Uh, okay, morning. we already have. Okay, sir, go on. Uh, Hear me? Okay. Um, just to share something regarding the value of methodology section in, in the journal or thesis or dissertation, based on my experience when I review uh, certain papers. Um, normally, the method section of a certain paper is the least read section by the readers. You know, if you're just reading an article, seldom you will see the method section. However, this, this section is very, very important for reviewers and editors. Why is it important? Because normally before a paper is sent for peer review, the editor would check and would try to look at the method section. Even if the introduction and the discussion and the findings are very, very important and are very promising, if the editor or the reviewer see that there's something wrong with the method section, then the paper gets rejected. That's why it's very, very important to plan well the method section. In fact, after you conduct the literature review and before you, you continue with the data collection, it is very, very important that when you develop the method section, you should do it with your statistician. The common problem with the researchers or perhaps with the new researchers or stu uh, graduate students is that they consult statistician after data collection, which is very, very wrong. That's why my advice is when you plan your study after you have conducted the literature review, make sure to consult your statistician. That's the only thing that I could share. Thank you. Ayan, those from a reviewer's and editor's perspective. Thank you so much for sharing us your ideas, Dr. Labrage. Now, we already have uh, the first question from Sir Maynard Kapil. Do you have an advice on how to improve authenticity in research? Dr. Kabagin. Okay, so as what I've said, uh, Sir Maynard, uh, the use of plagiarism check is very important for us to really see if uh, uh, the similarity index of our study from the other study. Plagiarism check, too, sir. All right, thank you, Dr. Kabaging. Um, I hope your question was answered, uh, Mr. Kapil. Another question from Sir Vicente Carillo Jr. Ma'am, can a simple descriptive research without using a complex analysis be a good paper and a publishable paper? Again, uh, Dr. Kabaging, can a simple descriptive research without using a complex analysis be a good paper and a publishable paper. Okay, 
So I am also reading here your question. Actually, sir, you don't really need to have a very complicated uh, uh, research method in order to come up with a very good uh, with, with a very good study. Um, a simple descriptive research is is already a good uh, or a publishable paper as long as you are able to answer the the objectives or the aim of your study, and then the, um, the output of that for uh, of the, your research is um, useful. So that is the most important thing: the use of the your research paper. Okay, thank you, Dr. Kabaging. Um, another question from uh, Ms. Jihan Adil. Ma'am, what is the most acceptable methodology for determining appropriate sample size for a group of study subjects when there is no official statistic or data on their population? Again, what is the most acceptable methodology for determining appropriate sample size for a group of study subjects when there is no official statistic or data on their population? Dr. Kabaging? Okay. Mom, okay. Um, most acceptable methodology for determining appropriate sample size. So we'll get the sample size when there is no. Okay, you really need to identify the population first of your study because if there is no population, how can you have the sample size of your study if it is quality? No, you need to identify your population to ma'am. And then if you are able to identify the population, you can make use now of the different sampling techniques. Um, Dr. Ladrage wants to share something about sample size. Uh, go on, sir. Okay. Uh, again, good morning. I think the question of um, mm -hmm. is, there, is this Ms. Jihad or, or Mr. Jihad? I don't know. Um, regarding the acceptable methodology of determining appropriate sample sites. This is a very good question and this is very critical. And I agree to Dr. Uh, Abigail Kabagin that as much as possible, if there is a, an available uh, population size, it's better. Mm -hmm. However, this is a very, very challenging issue, especially in areas where in population is very difficult to retrieve. But the good thing is, with the advent of technology, we can actually identify the sample size using several software. For example, we have the G power. The G power is very, very important because it will help you calculate the sample size. And there are actually a lot of free softwares available online that can help you identify the sample size. You just need to identify how many variables are included, what type of statistics are you going to use, and then by identifying those things and by using those softwares, you can actually identify the sample size. Even in the Google, you can actually have those things. Even for myself, I have a um, few published papers wherein I do not know the, the population of the study because in some instances, it is really difficult to, to look for those values. So in those instances, I try to use G-Power or some uh, sample calculator to identify the sample size. Thank you. Thank you for that, uh, Dr. Labrage. Uh, we have another question from Sir Emerson Valvar. This is also about uh, the sample size. He asks, uh, let's say the researcher conduct, conducts phenomenology and case study. And like in quantitative descriptive research where researchers are after the generosity of findings, in qualitative research, we're after the trustworthiness and credibility of findings. What do you have to say about this, uh, Dr. Kabaging? Okay. Um, uh, yes, sir, we can have a hybrid study of uh, combining phenomenology and case study. So that's what we call hybrid. So if in quantitative, we are more after on the generalizability of the findings, in qualitative research, and I am very happy that you are familiar with the different rigors in qualitative research, and you mentioned the trustworthiness and the credibility, we also have that one in qualitative research. Say, for example, the validity in quantitative research is equivalent to the credibility in qualitative research. The generalizability in quantitative research is equivalent to the transferability 
um, in qualitative research. So say for example, the result of the qualitative research should be um, should also be experienced by other um, by by um, by the by those who are not part the participants of the study. And also, we also have this what we call dependability in the rigors of qualitative research, which is also equivalent to the reliability in quantitative research. And then, of course, we have another rigor in qualitative research, which, which is confirmability, which is equivalent of objectivity in quantitative research. Yes, sir, Paul, we can have both phenomenology and case study. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Kabaging. Last question, uh, and our open forum will come to an end. Um, last question from Sir Maynard Kapil. In developmental type of research, do you think traditional data collections may eventually become irrelevant? Again, in developmental type of research, do you think traditional data collections may eventually become irrelevant? Dr. Kabaging. Okay, so actually, um, in the development type of research, we uh, the the traditional data collection, which is survey and interview, is also useful in the, the development. Say, for example, you are developing an instrument, and you're in the development of instrument is using the the traditional approach, only that we make use of a more advanced method. Say, for example, we make use of mixed method from exploratory to um, uh, explanatory, uh, to, from quality, I mean, to quantitative. Say, uh, the development of instrument will start from interviews, and then the interviews will be quantified. And then after quantification, then, uh, then you can have uh, a developed instrument of, or depends on the research that you are undertaking. But we cannot say that the basic or the traditional methods of collecting data are irrelevant. All right, that ends the open forum for uh, this session. That concludes our webinar session for today. Thank you so much for joining us. Our heartfelt gratitude to Dr. Abigail Kabaging, Summer State University's Director of Alumni Services and Director of Institutional Student Programs and Services for imparting her valuable expertise in the field of research and journal publication. We also thank the lead facilitators of this webinar series, Summer State University's Office of the Vice President for Research and Extension Services through the university publications. Also, thank you to the editor-in-chief of CDRJ, Dr. Leo Labrague, for imparting um, some ideas to us. Finally, we thank our viewers and participants. Thank you, thank you for joining us. Just a few reminders. We will email you the links of the session evaluation, quiz, and the presentations of today's lecture. And our next session will be on June 26, this Friday, on the subject of choosing data and writing the results. See you again. Thank you so much.